Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of the CG Signature Lecture Series. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us tonight at this event, whether you're here as part of our live audience or joining us through the live webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences. If you're here in the CG Auditorium, you can ask your questions at the mic at the bottom of the stairs. And if you're at home, you can ask your questions through the live chat function on your screen. Please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. When we think about heroes, many of us might think of people in capes and masks and tights. But after the most recent global financial crisis, it took a different kind of hero to fight the regulatory problems in the financial world. Tonight, Dr. Kevin P. Gallagher will talk about some of the unlikely champions of better regulation. And here to more properly introduce tonight's speaker is Catherine Hostetler, who is CG Chair of Governance in the Americas at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. She's an expert in emerging powers and global governance, as well as South American politics, civil society, and social movements, and climate change in Brazil and South Africa. So please join me in welcoming Catherine to introduce tonight's speaker. I'm really pleased tonight to introduce an old friend and very um, well-known scholar of these topics that you'll be listening to tonight. Kevin Gallagher is an Associate Professor of Global Development Policy at Boston University, where he co-directs the Global Economic Governance Initiative and the Global Development Policy Program. He's also a faculty fellow at BU's Frederick S. Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. He has written too many publications for me to really be able to give you a full listing of them, but I can at least list the books that he's written. He's the author or co-author of The Dragon in the Room, China and the Future of Latin American Industrialization, also The Enclave Economy, Foreign Investment and Sustainable Development in Mexico's Silicon Valley, and Free Trade in the Environment, Mexico, NAFTA and Beyond, and many other works. Professor Gallagher serves on the U.S. Department of State's Investment Subcommittee of the Advisory Committee on International Economic Policy and the International Development Division of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. He is also the author of a new book um, entitled Ruling Capital, Emerging Markets, and the Re-Regulation of Cross-Border Finance. That's the book that is the backdrop to his talk tonight. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Gallagher. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you. Thanks, CG, for having me here, and thank all of you for coming here. Uh, as a half Irishman from Boston, I have to start by saying Happy St. Patrick's Day. I probably should have a pint of Guinness with me here, but uh, then I'd make a pretty difficult subject even more difficult for you to understand and me to talk about, so I'll, uh, so I'll hold off there. Uh, it truly is great to be here. I'm here for a workshop tomorrow, and I've always wanted to uh, see what's going on up at CG. You've only been here for, been around for a few, a few years, but I can tell you that you've really made an impact outside, uh, outside of Waterloo and Canada uh, on these important issues around global governance. I'm uh, going to talk about my new book called Ruling Capital, Emerging Markets, and the Re-Regulation of Cross-Border Finance. And the book really uh, sheds light on some of the undercurrents that are occurring in the global economy right now um, and some of the new tailwinds that are happening in the global economy that we can hopefully have a conversation about some of the insights that I've had and how they might be able to uh, uh, fix what's going on. I'm going to make four points. Uh, upper left-hand corner, I'm going to make the case uh, that many economists are now making, which is the regulation of cross-border financial flows, not big companies like uh, uh, Seagram's moving from Waterloo to Mexico or something like that, but cross-border financial flows such as foreign exchange derivatives, stocks, short-term bonds, and so forth, that the regulation of those across borders is justified now more than ever. Secondly, guy in the uh, upper right-hand corner, uh, is one of the heroes uh, that we just heard about. 
Um, he's a regulator in Brazil, um, which shows that in many emerging market and developing countries, Indonesia, uh, Taiwan, Brazil, South Korea, a number of others, re-regulated cross-border financial flows since 2008, since the crisis in 2008 and 2009, which was a pretty incredible task given the fact that they had deregulated themselves in the 1990s. It's much harder to re-regulate than it is to uh, add or strengthen existing regulations. In addition to putting in place regulations at home, many emerging market and developing countries played a big role at the International Monetary Fund, my third point, in preserving and enhancing some of the policy space they've had to make those regulations at home. The last slide is a picture, or the last point is a picture of how the winds in the global economy are changing. Um, we've got an uptick in growth in the United States, perceived increases in the interest rates in the United States, while Chinese economy is slowing down and while commodities prices are slowing down. That spells trouble for many emerging markets and a lot of the cross-border financial flows that flooded into emerging markets since 2008 are now flittering away. And some of these interesting regulations that they put in place in, since the crisis were not strong enough and we're not coupled with equal measures on the industrialized countryside. And we're in, we're in a point where we're gonna see some real instability and slow growth in emerging markets because of it. So let me get to my first point, <clears throat> which is that regulating cross-border financial flows is justified now more than ever. It's actually one of the forefronts of new economic thinking in the core of the mainstream of economic thought that has also permeate, permeated the research departments of the, Bureau, of the Bank of International Settlements and the International Monetary Fund. Before I tell you about the new economics of regulating capital flows, I should probably tell you about the old economics of, capital, of regulating capital flows. <clears throat> I won't go too far in history yet, but I'll start by talking about the 1990s. And in the 1990s, the prevailing wisdom was that cross-border financial flows were inherently good for emerging markets in developing countries. Why? Because almost inherently, a developing country doesn't have enough investment. And so if you're blocking out investment, how are you gonna get the investments into the productive employment generating activities that you need to catch up to industrialized countries and to enjoy the standard of living that we have here? So there was economic theory behind that that said if countries open up their uh, what's called their capital account, the, 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 the accounting and their balance of payments framework, which restricts the ability of financial flows to come in and out. If you liberalize financial flows, you'll get more financial flows in and it'll translate into economic growth. Second key tenant of the old economics of capital flows was that in order to attract those cross-border financial flows, you had to have good fundamentals. What does that mean? Balance your fiscal budgets, have a flexible exchange rate, have a high interest rate that'll attract that finance and keep inflation down. If you do those things, you're gonna be the recipients of this short-term capital that can come into your economy. And thirdly, if you try to regulate that stuff, it's inherently distortionary to your economy. It's gonna cause distortions in your economy, they're gonna slow down growth, not quicken it, but that's only if the regulations work. And in a high technology, end of 20th century world where financial flows can be managed uh, at a keyboard, uh, good luck trying to regulate this stuff anyways because it's, uh, because it's much, much more difficult to regulate. Well, fast forward till about 2003, 2004, this is a real hot topic for economists to get into, and there's been new empirical and theoretical breakthroughs which overturn almost all three of those, all three of those premises. First, a lot of econometric analysis has been done which examined the extent to which those countries that liberalized their financial flows grew. And the resounding evidence is that those countries that liberalized their economies for financial flows did not grow, and secondly, they were more prone to banking crises because financial flows are inherently pro-cyclical. Uh-oh, what is that nerd talking about? What he means by pro-cyclical is that there's lots of surges of this kind of financial flows in your economy when things are going good, but when things are going bad, it takes off. So you, need, you get the finance almost when you need it the least, when things are already going really well, but when you need finance, it, it, it goes away. Uh, and thirdly, that uh, 
the main driver of financial flows are not fundamentals in emerging market and developing countries, it's actually monetary policy in the industrialized country. The biggest driver of capital flows or financial flows to emerging markets is the federal funds rate in the United States. When the federal funds rate is relatively low to other interest rates around the world and has been for a significant period of time, uh, that is when credit expands out of industrialized countries into emerging markets in this pro-cyclical manner. Because it happens pro-cyclically, it causes financial instabilities that I'll talk about in a few minutes, and therefore economic theory has made advances that understand capital flows in a context of imperfect information in the financial system which say that those investors don't realize that maybe that last speculative dollar that you're putting into the Brazilian uh, currency market might be the one that causes financial instability that could cause a crisis or at least make you not get your money back. And that neither do all of the collective investors that are investing in a particular country. They don't know what the systemic risk implications of their investments might be. And therefore, the market, what you need to do is correct the market failure with a regulation, a tax, what we call, nerds like me call a Pigouvian tax, just like environmental economists say, gosh, if you're polluting a, a coal into the atmosphere uh, from Detroit and it's causing economic damages to crops in New Hampshire and in, in, in southeastern Canada, uh, those costs need to be incorporated into the decision making. And if you do that, markets will work better and you'll actually grow faster. It's the same idea with the financial markets. There's so much imperfect information in order to maintain systemic risk, you need to have regulations in place. And when regulations are in place, they're not inherently distortionary, they are corrective. They're correcting market failures which make economies grow better than, uh, than if you don't have them. Thirdly, a number of uh, econometric analyses by the International Monetary Fund and uh, National Bureau of Economic Research and nerds like me uh, have shown that these regulations, when they're put in place, actually work. Uh, here's a picture of capital flows to emerging markets from 1980 to 2013, and I'll show one that goes uh, until a couple months ago in a minute. But what you can see here, again, this is, this is not foreign direct investment. This isn't companies moving. This is short-term uh, currency movements and derivatives and so forth. And just like I explained, these things occur in what we refer to as surges when you get massive inflows and sudden stops when all of a sudden there's lots of capital flight. Okay, and if, if this stuff was determined by market fundamentals, you wouldn't see these uniform, sharp up, ups and downs, right? You'd, it would be all over the place for all different emerging markets. But you see massive surges and massive uh, sudden stops, and every significant sudden stop has been associated with a significant emerging market uh, or industrialized country crisis uh, in the early 1980s after capital flows dried up in Mexico, there was the Mexican crisis that rippled across Latin America, and anywhere you go in Latin America now, you hear of the 1980s as their lost decade, because it caused 10 years of no growth. Uh, then again, in Mexico in 1994, uh, there was a sudden stop, there was a crisis there, which obviously moved to the Asian financial crisis, Brazil, Argentina, Russia, and beyond, or Russia and then Argentina, I should say. Uh, then there was a surge of capital flows after the Argentine crisis, that obviously ended uh, at the global financial crisis, caused a sudden stop there. Obviously, we, Pakistan, Ukraine, Estonia, uh, Latvia, Iceland are all victims of this. Then there was another surge and a sudden stop with the, with the Euro crisis. Let me dig deeper into the economic dynamics that create the instability during these surges, those big peaks, and the sudden stops when you get the big troughs. When you get a surge, okay, you get lots and lots of demand for the investments in your economy, the short-term investments in your economy, and that makes your currency appreciate, right? If your currency's in demand, it's more scarce, and so the value of it appreciates. So if I'm a company that wants to raise money in global capital markets, and all of a sudden the value of the, of the Brazilian real or the South Korean won goes up, I feel like I have more collateral to borrow even more money denominated in international dollars. So it causes significant credit expansion. And in the short term, it really impacts economic growth. And this is what we saw after 2008. There was lots of discussion about the two-speed recovery in the world economy. Okay, we had the United States and Europe had blown ourselves up. 
um, and the emerging markets were growing really fast. Um, a lot of it had to do with massive inflows that went into their economies from 2008 till about 2013. However, at the end of 2013 and all throughout 2014 to today, and there's been lots of discussion about the Federal Reserve's tapering or, or raising interest rates in the United States. And as that occurs, what's starting to happen is what I refer to as the great unwinding and a lot of the positions that, that, that investors took after the financial crisis are being unwound and capital's going back into the United States. When that happens, your currency depreciates because there's less demand for your currency and for your goods. Well, when your currency depreciates, but you still borrowed all these instruments denominated in dollars, you still have to pay those dollars back. So you have to shovel out more South Korean won. You have to shovel out more Brazilian real to pay those debts, which is even harder because you're at a point under slow growth. And this is where we are right now. We just moved from 2009 to 2013. Emerging markets were here. They were the flavor of the month. They were growing really fast. They were selling all this stuff to China. Interest rates were really, really low in the United States. There was massive inflows of capital into the emerging market in developing countries. And there was credit expansion and swift economic growth. Now the tides are turning. Interest rates high in the US. Commodity prices low. China's economy transforming and slowing down. Emerging markets are slowing down because some of this is unwinding. When it happens, you all of a sudden have a huge debt problem, and I'll get into the size of that in a second. So economists, like I said, uh, have started to examine this, and here's a nice article that is written for non-economists in the IMF Economic Review about, uh, by one of the uh, pioneer economists who's work on this stuff, says that <clears throat> this, this, these cycles are too much for any one investor to know when she or he is investing in a particular economy. And so the, the government has to have a policy in place to be counter-cyclical so that the surges aren't so high and the sudden stops aren't so low. Here's a picture of gross capital flows from 1995 till 2015. The last one was scaled to GDP. Um, and what economists are most united on is that we really feel like there should be regulations on the inflow of capital. Right? When you're the flavor of the month, when things are going really well, that's when you should cool off the heating. That will prevent the most systemic risk. If you blow that or those weren't strong enough, then you might be forced to put regulations on the outflow of capital. So Iceland had to do that after the financial crisis. Malaysia after its 1998 financial crisis. Ukraine uh, four or five times over the past year has had to put capital controls on the outflow of capital. And if you really get into a big problem, you're, you're obviously restructuring your debt in some way. The new economics of regulating capital flows, however, says that regulating here is the most effective for uh, correcting for market failures, preventing systemic risks in the first place, uh, and that can actually make your economy grow rather than distort it. Many emerging markets have did that in between 2002 to 2011. Brazil, Indonesia, South Korea, uh, India, China have had them in place for a long time, Peru, Thailand, a number of countries across the emerging world put in regulations on the uh, inflow of capital. This is a messy graph, a messy table, but uh, not only did many emerging markets regulate the inflow, they actually innovated and came up with a new, new, uh, new family of instruments and regulations to regulate the inflow of capital. Some countries did it the old fashioned way. China and India have had strict, blunt uh, regulations that just say, Certain kinds of capital can't come in unless it's approved. Certain types of capital can't come out unless it's approved. An innovation in the 1990s by the Chilean Central Bank that was copied by the Colombians and India and a number of countries uh, over the 1990s was to generally have liberalized capital flows, but during those big surges, put a tax on them, a short-term tax, sort of a speed bump to slow it down. That's what I call a second generation regulation on capital flows. And the new ones that were created during the financial crisis are a host of foreign exchange derivative regulations. Because the, the key channel by which 
the financial crisis became global in many cases and the key channel of all these capital flows to emerging markets in the post-crisis world has been through the foreign exchange derivatives market. Well, political scientists and people in the markets and central bankers said, when they, when they saw this is happening, they're saying, this isn't supposed to happen, this can't happen. Because there's been a pretty much of a consensus up until the turn of the century that even if economists is gonna tell you that the right thing to do optimally is to regulate capital flows into your economy, the political system and the state of technology in this day and age are just never gonna let, let it, get it get it through. Political scientists have something called the capital mobility hypothesis, which says A, technology is so sophisticated now they can swing around uh, different regulations. Two, the political interest groups that would be against this kind of regulation are really strong. You've got international finance, one of the strongest in interest groups in the world economy, that's gonna couple with the exporters in your country that are dependent on that international finance, and the two of them are never gonna let, uh, are gonna put a lot of pressure on any kind of regulation that's gonna come through. Other folks have emphasized that the ideology around this, that central banks and finance ministries especially, there's been a diffusion of an ideology that regulating financial markets causes more trouble than it's worth. And then there was always the fear that the IMF was gonna parachute in and, uh, and, and scorn you in their Article 4 report, which would then get picked up by the credit rating agencies and, and have a real effect on your economy. So those, for those reasons, people would expect that emerging markets would not regulate that. I come up with something in my, in, my, uh, in my book called A Theory of Countervailing Monetary Power, which shows how some emerging markets were able to re-regulate finance and some weren't. It basically comes down to, to four factors. Uh, one, uh, I, did, I did a number of case studies of the countries that did it, but the four that I really focused on are two that re-regulated and two that didn't. The two that re-regulated are Brazil and South Korea came up with these innovative foreign exchange derivatives regulations, and two that didn't were South Africa and Chile. Interestingly, Chile has one of the most innovative regulations on their books, but they didn't use it. The two country, the, the countries that, uh, that did the re-regulations, <clears throat> both of them had permanent regulations that the central bank has on the books that allows them to act quickly during a surge. So they don't have to pass a piece of legislation saying, hey, we wanna put a regulation in the foreign exchange derivatives market because as an American, we know this really well, it takes us five years to get any regulation passed. By the time you get the regulation passed, the, <laughs> you've had a surge and a sudden stop and a financial crisis. And so you need a permanent piece of legislation that allows the finance ministry and or the central ba bank uh, to, to act quickly. Both countries have many options for access to credit. All right? In Brazil, they have a development bank and stiff regulations that make private banks have finance denominated in, the, in their own country's currency to be available for firms. It's sort of mandated or actually given through the development bank. In South Korea, they have this chai bowl, which they fund a lot of work, uh, a lot of new projects through uh, retained earnings, and they also have a pretty significant domestic bond market that is denominated in, uh, in, in won. Because of those diverse options to credit, it severs this alliance between exporters and international capital. Both in Brazil and in South Korea, exporters were asking the central bank and the finance ministry to use the regulation that they had on the books because they were more concerned about currency appreciation than they were about access to credit, right? As their currency appreciated, all of a sudden, if you're selling, uh, if you're selling components to the Chinese from South Korea, your currency appreciates, but the Malaysian currency doesn't. The Chinese are buying the stuff from Malaysia and you're getting shut out of the commodity chain. So the Brazilian, excuse me, the South Korean exporters are slamming on the door of the finance ministry because they're not as dependent on the international finance uh, as they were in the Chilean case and as they are, were in the Indonesian and South African cases. Uh, both of these countries also had long histories of financial crises and although many political scientists say, hey, when the currency appreciates, consumers and workers like that because they can buy more flat screens, but if you've lived, lived through four or five crises, you'd rather have a job and no flat screen than a flat screen and no job. 
And so workers and the parties around them are much more supportive of these kinds of regulations than you would expect because they too are more driven or more worried about exchange rate volatility rather than just short-term appreciations. In terms of uh, uh, ideas and leadership also play a, a key role. Uh, after the financial crisis, there's been a big conversation at the G20 and the Financial Stability Board about the need for macro prudential regulations, and especially the pragmatic uh, central bankers and finance folks in South Korea created these new foreign exchange derivatives regulations and actually announced them to the world at the Seoul Summit in a panel next to the FSB head talking about their new family of foreign exchange derivatives regulations. And one of the Bloomberg reporters at the press conference said, hey, isn't that a capital control? And they said, no, 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 these are foreign exchange derivatives regulations to stem systemic risk in our, in our credit markets. And the Bloomberg people said, oh, okay, I understand that. And so they communicate, all right, as opposed to the Brazilians whose regulations didn't work that well, where uh, Guido Mantega, the finance minister, said, we're putting in place capital controls that are against the imperialist uh, Ben Bernanke, who's flooding our economy with a tsunami of capital flows, interestingly, <clears throat> the regulations that both countries have are exactly the same. They came out of the same workshop. Uh, same little position limits on foreign exchange derivatives, um, but they framed it in a different way. Um, the South Koreans were able to create a more sense of a calm with international capital markets and with people who were opposed to them at home. The Brazilians didn't do that globally, but they actually did do it in an internal fight where the finance ministry wanted the regulations, the capital, the central bank didn't. And the two of them have to decide on these short-term regulations. And the finance ministry you know, said the opposite of what, the, uh, what they were saying to the public. They were convincing the central bank that these were the pragmatic macro prudential things to do that all these economists up at the MIT and the IMF say are the good thing to do now. And in both countries, leaders evoked the collective memory of financial crisis. If you've been to South Korea, if you know anyone from South Korea, they refer to 1997 as the IMF years. It's a very dark year in their period. Uh, same thing in Brazil. They talk about the crises in the 1990s, very, very dark periods. And so while garnering support for these kind of regulations and framing them to the public, and there was an election in Brazil during, when, during a lot of these regulations, <clears throat> they're always evoking the collective memory of the, of the past uh, of the past crises. And these three things together enabled some of these countries to be heroic as you framed it, whereas others were not able to. What's actually perhaps even more interesting is uh, these countries were able to punch against, punch above their uh, voting weight or their quota power at the International Monetary Fund to preserve the, fine, the policy space that they had for these kind of regulations. When there was the big sudden stop, that big trough that I showed you from 2008 when finance, ironically, after the U.S. crisis, all left emerging markets and went to the U.S. economy as a safe haven, central bankers were calling Dominique Strauss-Kahn at, at the International Monetary Fund saying, our economies are bleeding so much, we might have to put on capital controls on outflows. Are you going to come down on us for this? And one of the key people who did that was the, for, the central banker of Israel at the time, uh, Stanley Fisher. And said, I think I'm going to have to put capital controls on outflows. Are you going to come after me at the press? Well, it came at a very interesting time for the IMF where it was trying to regain its clout in the world economy because it had become stigmatized, especially in emerging markets after the Asian financial crisis and its role in Argentina. And Dominique Strauss-Kahn seized on it. He had actually just gave, uh, he assembled all the key staff in an amphitheater like this and had just given a big speech about how you all have to go out there and think outside of the box and I want to see stuff on my desk that's fresh and new thinking. He, get, he gets these calls and this one guy comes up to him and shows him a paper where he found uh, on an econometric analysis that those countries that put in regulations, emerging market countries that put in regulations on cross-border inflows of capital before the crisis were among the least hard hit during the crisis. This is something that would never have been published in the IMF in the 1990s. Dominique Strauss-Kahn makes the entire staff go back into that amphitheater and him uh, present the thing in a big open discussion, which was very heated, creates a new working paper series and puts it out there. It gets all this press and Dominique Strauss-Kahn is out there telling the world that these countries should be doing this kind of stuff. The United States goes bananas. They said, oh my God, the IMF's going to be telling people to, uh, you know, fix exchange rates and do all sorts of crazy stuff. We've got to put the genie in the bottle. <clears throat> Let's create a process to get clear 
so that IMF folks in hotels in, in, in Canada are, tell, are given the same kind of advice about this stuff when they're in Nigeria and when they're in Chile and when they're in Brazil. And so from 2010 to 2012, there was actually a board level negotiation over a new set of guidelines on how to manage capital flows at the International Monetary Fund. And at the very beginning, some of the folks stuck from the 90s uh, wanted to use it as an example to uh, change the articles of agreement of the International Monetary Fund so to make the regulation of capital flows illegal. Uh, I should say that in the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund uh, that regulating capital flows, you have all the space in the world to do it. Uh, required reading for anyone who's under the age of 75 is Eric Leiner's book, uh, Nation States and the Reemergence of Global Finance. Is that the name? That's the, that's the name of the book? Where he goes into this, uh, there was so much contention at the founding of the International Monetary Fund, but one of the few things that the United States and Great Britain agreed upon, Harry Dexter White and, uh, and John Maynard Keynes, was that countries needed to be able to regulate capital flows if you really wanted the engine of the world economy to be global trade. And if you had too much speculation in short-term capital flows, you're going to create too much uh, volatility, too much crises, it's going to disrupt the trading system and that that should be the generator of global growth. Uh, not only did Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes say that countries should regulate capital flows. They said they should be regulated on both ends. They should be regulated not only by the emerging markets, but also the source of the capital flows in the north. So on one level, when this, uh, uh, in the 1990s, during that old thinking on capital flows, a number of countries tried to change the Articles of Agreement and get this particular part changed so that countries would not be able to regulate capital flows. Uh, given the fact that capital flows played such a big, issue, a big role in uh, the Asian financial crisis, a number of non-governmental organizations and, and heroic uh, Congress people in the United States put an end to that uh, um, change in the Articles of Agreement, but those forces are still there in the United States Treasury and parts of the U.S. government, and their initial uh, reaction to this guideline period was, well, let's go back to that. Uh, they, quote, said, well, we realized that the genie was out of the bottle, and so their negotiating strategy became, let's create a distinction between two different kinds of regulations of capital flows. And there actually are two different kinds of regulations of capital flows. One kind of regulating capital flows, the kinds I've been talking about, is to try to maintain financial stability. Regulations on massive surges of capital flows and regulations on massive sudden stops and lots of capital flight. But some of countries, like France you know, in, the, in the early 20th century, in the United States up in, uh, up, uh, in the early 20th century, and many Latin American countries in the 1950s, and many Asian countries until the 1990s, they regulated capital flows for a different reason, to direct credit to new industries. They created a capitalist class that created all these new companies, um, and they were worried that if a new company starts doing well, uh, they might want to invest overseas rather than reinvesting their profits into the domestic economy. So they would put a cap on that. The country that is the exemplar of that now is China. All right? Until a couple months ago, uh, they've had a very closed system of capital. Uh, cap their capital account has been very closed because when all those domestic, they, they created a, an economy where if you raise the wage uh, on the eastern seaboard, of China and attract all these manufacturing companies there, you'll get folks from the countryside to work in all these big factories. Those factories are gonna make a lot of money, especially if you make your exchange rate competitive. They're gonna make a lot of money expo exporting around the world. But since they're still a fledgling economy, those new capitalists, if they were rational actors, they'd probably put some of the money in Swiss banks, they'd put some of the money in the United States, they'd put some of the money in restaurants around the world. And so let's not allow them to do that. Let's make them pour the money back into China. It's part of the Chinese miracle. Um, the United States said we are not gonna endorse that. And so their baseline negotiating position on this is we're going to make a distinction between capital regulations for directing credit and capital regulations for financial stability. So in a lot of ways, they were successful. At the, at the end of the day, I won't, I won't go into it. In Q&A, I can, I can talk about it. Um, there's four main things in the, in the new IMF guidelines. One, they say countries shouldn't always liberalize their economy for financial flows. And if they do, they should do it slowly in a sequenced manner. Two, they should put regulations on inflows, uh, but they should try a bunch of other things first. Three, they should put capital, 
controls on outflows of capital under dire circumstances, and in fact, the IMF recommended it and, and insisted upon it in the country programs in Ukraine and in Iceland. And fourth, and very interestingly, they said nations could con consider regulating on both ends, the way uh, John Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White said. And one thing that amazingly got through is that they said that many trade and investment treaties are at odds with re regulating capital flows. So you see this kind of language in every single one of the IMF communiques now. And I put together a couple of graduate student slaves and made them code every single Article 4 report from 1990 to 2015. And we did an econometric analysis and showed and found that, uh, that it's not just communiques and speeches where the IMF has changed its tune. They're actually recommending that countries regulate capital flows. They recommended it to Mexico. They recommended it to South Africa. They recommended it to Peru. They endorse Brazil's. They endorse South Korea's. Uh, in between 2009 and 2014. And also, obviously, they wrote it right into the Ukraine deal. They wrote it right into the uh, Iceland deal. This also uh, played a role at the G20, and the G20 has really one step forward and two steps back on regulating capital flows. At the 2011 Con Summit, if you remember, uh, the BRICS countries were essentially asked by the Europeans to help bail out Greece and the other countries in crisis. It eventually didn't happen, but the BRICS seized the moment and said, well, let's negotiate a few things before we really talk about that. And I actually only have about 45 minutes because we're having a meeting across the street in 45 minutes because we're going to create a new development bank and a contingent reserve arrangement. But what do you want to talk about? And one of the things that they did was create a document called the uh, Coherent Conclusions for the Regulations of Capital Flows. And you can read this paragraph, it's part of it. It basically just says that countries should have the policy space to regulate the inflow and outflow of capital, uh, not as a last resort, but uh, as part of their policy toolkit to deal with these surges and sudden stops. It was negotiated between the Germans and the Brazilians. Every finance minister signed it the next day, and every head of state signed it the day after that. I'll get into how that was, you know, it's just a piece of paper at the G20, they're great at that, uh, it doesn't have any teeth, but I'll show you how it was used in a minute. That's one step forward, but there's been two major steps back in terms of regulating capital flows at the G20. One, at the G20, we all agreed that we would coordinate our derivatives regulations to make sure that we could contain systemic risk after the crisis, because derivatives were a core of it. Well, one thing that the United States has done uh, is that right before Secretary Geithner left office, he, he um, exempted foreign exchange swaps and derivatives from the Dodd-Frank bill. His defense of that was the forex market isn't broke. Why should we try to fix it? The financial crisis in the United States was a function of derivative, housing derivatives, collateralized debt obligations in the housing market, right? That's the crisis. That's what we're going to go after. Let's not do anything to the foreign exchange. Well, that, that's sort of in, in direct defiance of the spirit of the G20 because it's exactly, if you look at every BIS report, there was basically three ways that the financial crisis became a global one. One of them was derivatives, foreign exchange derivatives being on balance sheets around the world. The second one was trade, right? China had a closed financial system, so they didn't get hit by the banking system. They got hit because the U.S. economy fell, the Europeans fell, and they weren't, there wasn't anyone to trade anything from. And the third was remittances, right? There were uh, folks who, you know, Mex Mexican-Americans who lost their jobs, who were selling 20, sending $20 billion back a year back home to Mexico, obviously weren't doing that after they got unemployed after the crisis. So eliminating foreign exchange derivatives uh, is a way that could have been, if they had put, kept those regulations in, it could have been a way for the U.S. to regulate on its end of the capital flow, but by eliminating that, it creates a big window for these flows to fall to uh, emerging markets. Another thing is that the OECD and UNCTAD put out these reports before every G20 meeting called investor protectionism where they've recast regulations on investment the same way you do a tariff. And I was an economist, there's no theoretical basis to that. There's no theory that justifies, uh, that, that 
makes the equivalent between a tariff and any regulation on, on, uh, on investment. And in these reports, they've been singling out the very regulations that the IMF is endorsing and writing case studies about uh, in their Article 4 reports and in, their, and in their research documents and in their World Economic Outlook every year. They're getting singled out by the G20 as regulations that are causing protectionism and evoking the, uh, you know, the, the big tariffs of the, of, the, of the Great Depression era uh, and saying that these things have to be stopped. So it's a real step backward for the G20. How am I doing on time? I got okay. Okay. Well, I take this theory of countervailing monetary power and I explain partly how some of these countries were able to do this stuff at home, but in an environment where, heck, at the International Monetary Fund, uh, the U.S. has veto power. So how did the emerging markets get these regulations in place or at least be able to preserve the policy space they had and, and make, make, the, make the process be, uh, be, be more in their favor, more emerging market friendly. It comes down to a bunch of things. One, the BRICs together and the emerging markets together have a lot of market power. And even though that doesn't translate at all into quotas at the International Monetary Fund, that market power plus the legitimacy that they had after the crisis, that the crisis this time didn't happen in emerging markets, it happened in the United States, that, that was evoked a lot in their discussions at every meeting and their opening remarks at every meeting and it was sort of a united front to talk about that. More importantly though is they, they built a coalition, they had one already set in place during these conversations at the International Monetary Fund for quota reform. They have a weekly meeting, their staffs work together all the time, they put out joint statements, so they had a shovel-ready coalition in place that could also act during this. The other key thing that they did was that little G20 document that didn't really mean anything, got some press right afterwards and it got buried on the, is it the University of Toronto website that keeps all those uh, G20 documents? They got buried on that, but it didn't get buried by everybody because all the BRICS countries, when the US was, and the Canadians and the Europeans were pushing during these regulations at the International Monetary Fund, the BRICS said, no, your head of state has already said that we can use these in, in situations where they're not a last resort. So we have to take that language out. And so they're able to leverage things from different forums from the, inter, from, from the G20 and insert it into the board process at the IMF to punch above their weight. The other thing that they did was they were on the same page as the IMF staff. In the 1990s, when the US was pushing uh, deregulation of financial markets around the world, there were piles and piles of IMF staff papers saying that it was legitimate and economic models with all sorts of fun funky math in there, fuzzy math, some of it, uh, justifying it. But now under the, all these, uh, you know, the, the new head of uh, research at the International Monetary Fund was a former head of the economics department at MIT. He's one of the most renowned macroeconomists in the world. He also had a very special relationship with DSK and continues to have one with Lagarde. He has much more power than some of the, uh, some of the others have and had a much more academic feel and had lots of academics in who were part of these forefront of research. And this guy, Anton Kornack, was a, was a fellow during this whole period, very strategically placed there. Um, and so the IMF reports were justifying the emerging market proposals and discrediting the U.S. proposals. And so again, on one hand, the emerging markets, the Indians would say, hey, look, we signed this at the G20, Obama signed it, so did Merkel. And then on the other hand, they say, yeah, but the stuff, you know, it just doesn't work. So no, actually, the, here's a report done by Jonathan Ostry, uh, son of Sylvia Ostry from, here from, uh, from Canada, which uh, he's a number two person in the research department, PhD in economics from MIT. They're saying this stuff, the countries that use this stuff were better off after the financial crisis. And that, with the coalitions pushing that together, being very strategic about that, uh, allowed to make the out, uh, allowed these countries to, uh, to punch, above, punch above their quota weight. There's still a lot of work to be done. The regulations that countries used, there was not enough countries that used them. Many, in many cases, they weren't strong enough, and there was little to no action at both ends. And so there's still a lot of systemic risk that was built up uh, in the emerging market and developing economies. Uh, according to the BIS, there's $2.6 trillion in securities in emerging markets, and there's 3.1 trillion dollars in commercial bank loans in emerging markets, and over 70% of them are denominated in dollars. 
okay? And three, quarter, three quarters of it is actually corporate debt. It's not public debt. So you get the private sectors are completely over leveraged in dollars right now as the tides turn. U.S. interest rates go up. Federal fund rate go up. Growth seems to be gr picking up in the United States. China's growth used to be 10% a year. Now it's 7% a year, and it's consumption-based. That's ca causing commodity prices to go down. And IMF projections for economic growth in emerging markets are 4.3% a year, but if you take China out, it's 1.7% a year for Latin America, and it's 2.2% a year for Asia. Okay, so we're moving into a much slower period, and you're getting capital flight back to the United States. With the capital flight back to the United States, that $2.6 trillion in debt is going to be twice as hard to come up with when you've got 1.7% growth uh, and a depreciated currency. And so there's lots of systemic risk building up in the emerging markets right now. In the worst cases, the most vulnerable countries, it could turn into a crisis. But regardless, this, this volatility in capital flows is a real drag on growth. It's a real drag on growth. It's one of the key reasons why emerging markets are growing now. Another key problem is that in addition to the United States not signing up for foreign exchange derivatives regulations in the, uh, in the G20, which is allowing a big loophole for these capital flows to come in and out without regulation, they've also rebranded regulations on capital flows as trade barriers, just like those G20 investment protections, and are forging them right into the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. These are the heads of states regulating the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And if you look at the, the right-hand yeah, the right, the right column here, U.S. free trade agreements like the TPP and our bilateral investment treaties, they, the definition of investment isn't just foreign direct investment now. It actually lists bonds, derivatives, sovereign debt, all sorts of short-term instruments are now covered by the treaty. It requires that all members of the treaty have to let all capital flow among all partners of the treaty freely and without delay. And there's no, since NAFTA, there has never been a balance of payments exception to a U.S. treaty. And there is a prudential exception, but it's too narrow to allow countries to regulate capital flows. The worst thing about it is actually that part of the agreement is actually governed by the foreign firms themselves rather than the states. Whereas in the World Trade Organization, and I have this as what's fascinating is these U.S. treaties, and Canada's in part uh, uh, taking part of these as well, uh, it's very, very different. Under the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, you get to list which parts of you want to liberalize, and even if you list a sector that you want to liberalize, you can put limits on it. So Chile, under the World Trade Organization, said, we're going to liberalize our financial sector, but we have this law in the books, and when we get a huge surge, we want to be able to use it. That's fine. Also, at the at the WTO, there's a balance of payments exception. So if you really become a victim of capital flight, you're allowed to violate your treaty uh, obligations for a short-term period to be able to get your balance of payments back, uh, back into place. And if there is a dispute, it's done among states, among nation states. If the Canada has a beef with the United States uh, at the World Trade Organization, the Canadian company has to go to the Canadian government. The Canadian government gives it a laugh test and says, okay, this is an important case. I'm going to go after the U.S. government in a tribunal in Geneva. Under investor state dispute uh, resolution, J.P. Morgan circumvents the U.S. government. The U.S. government doesn't even know if J.P. Morgan is making a case against a particular country. And they'll go in and directly sue and file a claim against a foreign country for its regulations in a private tribunal at the World Bank uh, that only has three people in it and uh, has no, no transparency. Now, Canada, I should say, is on the forefront of this. Uh, Canada's free trade agreements and bits are much different. All of Canada's free trade agreements have a balance of payments exception. All of Canada's free trade agreements have a broader prudential exception that looks closer to the World Trade Organization. And in the cases of Chile and in Colombia, there's actually an annex that specifically notes the regulation that they have on the books that says under extenuating circumstances, you can use that.
So great for the Canadians. Unfortunately, all the Canadian banks that are doing, uh, uh, doing transactions with Colombia and Chile also have branches in New York, and so they can do those transactions through the U.S. because the U.S.-Chile Free Trade Agreement and the U.S.-Colombia Free Trade Agreement do not have those kinds of annexes. Those finance ministers pushed. They actually did the, tried to do the same thing. Canada let us do it, with all due respect, didn't have uh, as much clout. Is also, I know CG's worked a lot on sovereign debt restructuring and uh, in the investment chapters of US trade and investment agreements and many bilateral investment treaties that are proliferating around the world today, um, there is a reasonable concern about expropriation, right? Back in the 1950s, back in the 1960s, you had people taking over companies and giving them to the state. We don't want that. But creative lawyers have, uh, have expanded what, what normal people would think of uh, as uh, expropriation, and one of them has been into sovereign debt restructuring. Okay, so if you're at one of these big troughs and you couldn't come up with enough pesos to pay your international debts, you usually have to restructure your debt. And restructuring your debt means, well, I had these bonds and I can't pay you 100% of that bond. I can only pay you 40%, 60%, 30%. There's often, not always, a negotiation between the bondholders um, and, uh, and the debtors over what a haircut would be. Well, creative lawyers around these trade agreements have said, hey, wait a minute. If I'm taking the value of a bond or a loan and I'm reducing its value by 60%, 40%, 35%, even if under a collective action clause, 80% of the bondholders uh, tendered, that's an expropriation. By definition, a haircut is cutting the value of the, of the of, uh, of the asset. And so there's a number of cases against countries who have sovereign, who have restructured their debt under these treaties. One of them uh, is a billion dollar case by Italian bondholders against Argentina. Argentina restructured its debt 2001-2002. It's very controversial. Um, and bondholders, you've heard a lot about the New York case where uh, some of the bondholders are going after Argentina through the New York courts while others are using investment treaties to say, hey, this haircut was an expropriation, and it's moving through the case system. Now, I love Argentina, I live there, and we talked about Argentina at dinner, but Argentina's bond restructuring, um, uh, even though the majority, you know, super majority of bondholders uh, tender to it, it's considered a take it, a take it or leave it bond uh, restructuring, where they said, here's the amount of money we're gonna pay you back. You can take it or leave it. There's no negotiation, all right? The majority did. But that doesn't sit so well in international financial markets. What's fascinating is that there's now a case against Greece and there's now a case against Cyprus. And these were not take it or leave it bond restructurings. These were bond restructurings with the IMF, the ECB, the European Union sitting at the table. Uh, on the one hand, it brings big, now all of a sudden everyone's discovered this stuff because basically the IMF and the ECB are being sued by small little banks in Slovakia uh, and Greece. But uh, in these cases, they are making the case that a haircut is an expropriation or, or in fair and equitable treatment. And because the government can't screen these things, right, no, no European government would take a case against Greece for a negotiation that they just did but they don't have any say. These are governed by the private firms themselves through investor state dispute resolution, and these cases are proliferating. This is why the IMF, in their new, negotiate, in their, in their new guidelines, say these agreements have lots of holes and they need to be reformed. The last two slides. So there's a big economic policy to-do list that we need to, need to deal with here. We're in, a, we're in a real situation now with this set of trends I keep talking about rising interest rates in the U.S., rising growth in the U.S., slowdown in China, slowdown in commodities prices, depreciation of currencies, and capital flight out of emerging markets. I don't predict a major crisis, because one of the good things about markets is even if Venezuela or Argentina or Pakistan has a crisis, it's not going to spread to the whole world like it did uh, in the 1990s, but the most vulnerable countries will be in real trouble. But regardless, all emerging markets and the global economy as a whole will be slowing because of this phenomenon. And one of the instruments that some countries have been able to use to be able to buffer it is expending your foreign exchange reserves. Right? If I'm getting a, if my currency's dropping, right, I can use foreign exchange reserves to pull my currency off the streets or to buy my currency 
and pull it off the street to raise its value. But given the fact that commodity prices are going down, central banks are much more reluctant to spend those foreign exchange reserves because they're not going to be there over the next 10 years like they've been there for the, next, for the past 10 years. So four key policies that need to be on our economic policy to-do list is that now's the time uh, when there isn't a massive surge to put in place the kind of regulations that the Chile's and the South Korea's and the Brazil's have that allow the central bank, divorced to the political system, to be pragmatic and put in place temporary regulations for financial stability during surges and let go of them during smoother times and then putting them back in place during capital flight. There also needs to be an increased conversation at the G20. The U.S. needs to be singled out for uh, um, exempting foreign exchange derivatives regulations uh, because of its global systemic ne uh, risk nature at the G20. There needs to be a coherence. There needs to be conversations between the IMF and the G20. The IMF is saying these regulations are good. The G20 puts out a report on the same day that says these regulations are bad. I've literally, the, the World Economic Outlook of 2012 has all these case studies about Brazil and South Korea's uh, foreign exchange derivatives regulations where the investment protectionism report that came out the same year singled the same things out as concerns about protectionism that could uh, threaten the growth of the world economy. You gotta get your story straight on this. And there needs to be policy space and trade and investment agreements. And you, you gotta follow the, the Canada model that allows for exceptions and allows for carve outs for countries to be able to do the right thing, not the US model. I, I hope that the Canadians can convince the United States in TPP negotiations to uh, follow the lead that they've had uh, over, over time. We can talk about one of the things I've learned as a recovering economist is that uh, the economic policies are easier to prescribe than the political process that, that puts them in place. I came up with this uh, theory of countervailing monetary policy. I'm not going to walk through it, but uh, the harder job than these policies is the politics of these policies, and that's probably the, the biggest thing that I've learned from this book. Thanks a lot for your time. I'd be happy to field questions about this stuff and to uh, have a conversation together. Thank you. I know I'm standing between you and a Guinness, and me and a Guinness, but uh, there's stuff to talk about here. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm supposed to reiterate that if you want to ask a question, there's uh, microphones on, on both sides. I think what I'll do is take a, take a couple of them and take some off of the web when, when that gets up there. But uh, since uh, this is my first time in Waterloo, uh, I only know a handful of people here. Please uh, tell, me, tell me your name and uh, introduce yourself when you ask a question. Uh, I'm Edward Fortis from Waterloo. Uh, welcome to Orlu, and I'll try to uh, uh, give you an easy question, since you're all here first time. Um, over, I've learned that uh, putting regulation uh, or regulations on paper always look good, but uh, uh, implementing them is a different story. Um, I'll give you a recent example. Uh, a Swiss Frank, one day, uh, few six weeks ago, I think, went up uh, like 50%. So if a Swiss bank cannot regulate the Swiss currency, how come you uh, tell me that the Brazilians are going to regulate their economy? A very good point. I'll, I'll definitely answer Thank that. Uh, oh, I've got one here uh, from, from Agus in London. Uh, it's a late night for you. Uh, thanks for staying, uh, staying awake for us. What extreme regulations could we see for emerging countries when financial outflows occur, given the huge amount of debt and internal pressures involved? Thanks, Ogus. I'll, I'll talk, about, uh, talk about that. Eric. Okay. Yeah. So Eric Kleiner um, from Waterloo. <laughs> um, so I'm maybe a little bit more pessimistic than you are about, um, about where we're headed in the next year or two. Um, you were saying in some ways that there's just a few countries that you think are going to hit really serious troubles. But some of the statistics that you were quoting earlier, and I've seen as well, um, about dollar-denominated private, especially on the corporate side, debt, it, they're very high in some of the emerging market countries. And so um, I guess my question is, so the, if that's true, the type of crisis that they're going to have seems to me much more like the early 80s 
than the crisis we've been seeing more recently in the sense that it's, it's private external debt which then has to be socialized uh, in the context of some foreign exchange crisis. And uh, when it happened in the early 80s, the politics of socializing the debt in Latin America in particular was very, very contentious. Like, you know, why should the Argentine government take over what was a, in some cases it was multinationals who were borrowing from their headquarters, you know, and it got socialized by the Argentine government. So all those countries having been through that experience, which generated very heated politics in the countries, do you think, uh, if they hit it again, that type, it's not a sovereign debt crisis, it's a private debt crisis that gets socialized. Are they going to be willing, I guess is my question, to socialize the debt in the way that they did in the early 80s, you know, given the experience that they went through at that time? First of all, it's great to be told I'm an optimist because uh, I thought I was being pessimistic, but I, I must be St. Patrick's Day. All right, well, let me, let me take, uh, take, take these three and then, then, I can, then I can do another round. Very good point about the, uh, uh, there, I guess there's three components, right? Yes, economists are now saying, the IMF is now saying, go ahead and do this because it's the right thing to do. Two, the politics of actually getting done is really hard. And then, once you actually get the policy in place, you actually have to implement it. And what's fascinating is that the econometric, econometric evidence is showing that those countries that put these in place, by and large, they're working, but working better in some places than in others. Now, South Korea's are working a lot better than Brazil's. South Korea's foreign exchange derivatives market is over the counter, derivatives are deliverable, and there's no offshore market, okay? In Brazil, they're non-deliverable, you don't have to have any stake in the economy, and the majority of the foreign exchange derivatives market is offshore, which by definition, it's hard, you can only regulate it if someone's got part of their position in your country, which is easy to do. Uh, easy, easy to circumvent, right? You can, you can invest in Brazil through the ADR market in New York and never, not even know where it is. Um, and so Brazil's have been a, a lot more leaky. And so this is a real core message for India and China as they open up their financial systems and try to, in Chinese case, internationalize their, their currency if they move on to offshore markets and then all of a sudden start getting worried about capital flows and want to regulate them, it's really hard to re-regulate if your deregulation process also involves an offshore option. I mean, Eric's book uh, shows how that basically eroded the capital account regulations that we had in the industrialized countries. The establishment of the euro market is a key part of what, er uh, what eroded the regulations that we had in the north. And uh, in Brazil, India, China are uh, making that mistake. I mean, the, 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 one of the big debates right now is the carry trade in China in between the offshore and the onshore and the bleeding of capital that's been going out of China just as they've opened up their capital account just a tiny, tiny little bit. The U.S. Senate thinks they open up their capital account, everyone's going to want to invest, it's going to appreciate the economy, and factory jobs are going to come back to Ohio. Well, they've opened it up a tiny little bit and trillions of dollars are spilling out of the economy and the exchange rate is going down and they're exporting more toys to Ohio. But uh, they don't do economics in Washington too well. Uh, OGAs, uh, what extreme regulations could we see for emerging uh, countries when financial outflows occur? Well, the consensus that I talk about is if you've got really strong regulations on inflows, you never get in the big problem, and so you don't have the massive outflow problem. But if you do have the massive outflow problem, we're gonna see policies like Iceland's, where they literally have just you know, clamp down on the outflow of capital, and it's been, it's been seven or eight years now. Now, the IMF just put out its report last week and said this is one of the core things that saved their economy. Some of us would argue that they've actually been in place for a little bit too long, and it, it, it holds back some, some significant reforms that you want to do. But you're going to see, you know, Iceland, uh, Ukraine in the past six months, Belarus, we're already seeing a number of countries that are putting massive uh, uh, regulations on the outflow of capital. Uh, that gets you into a lot more trouble. That, if you have a trade treaty, you're in a lot of trouble with a country that does outflows because you really are seizing someone's existing asset. If you've got a trade treaty and you're, uh, when a private company is trying to uh, take a case against you because they put in a new regulation, that's a, I don't want to get into the legal things, but it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to, to, uh, to sue a country on that. But uh, for the most vulnerable economies, we're going to see more and more capital controls on outflows. Um, I, and, which is a segue into Eric's. Um, I'm 
I'm a real pessimist for emerging markets moving forward over the next half decade because they did, you know, only a handful of countries put in place effective enough regulations. They weren't countered on the other end. And there's all these holes, right? South Korea, I don't, I, I, the only thing I, you know, economists, we blew up the world in 2008, so don't trust me about whether I think there's gonna be a crisis or not. I don't think there's gonna be one in South Korea, all right? Brazil, possibly. But I, I do think that's out there on the toil. But, but what's worse, right, what, what's worse and what makes me uh, agreeing with you on the pessimism is that this is the undercurrent of emerging markets. These the short-term flows is crowding out the ability to get into long-run development. And it's causing volatility in exchange rates and macroeconomic conditions, which never let countries diversify their production base, which never let them move into uh, productive, em productive employment. And so it's, it's one of the core reasons of slow, slowing growth, right? The commodities price and capital vo volatility are the two things that are really hurting emerging, emerging markets. So we're going to get really slow growth. Everyone predicts really slow growth. Everyone says this is a big part of it for the next five years. Which countries are going to fall off the cliff and which countries are going to be victims of contagion of that, you know, we can debate, but I'll be, I'll be clear to say, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I could come up with a, you know, I, I don't want to say anything because this thing is, is simulcast. You can come up with a list of three countries off the bat in, in, in Latin America that would go off. But the key point you are saying that does make it scary that if a country does go over the cliff, it's going to be the private sector and one of the things that we've learned about emerging markets, especially in Latin America and Africa, is that they squandered the commodity boom. That they didn't save enough of the high prices and the big profits they got from commodities exports. They also, the governments, didn't capture enough fiscal revenues. They actually gave tax breaks to the companies to come in and export the, the copper uh, to around the world and so forth. And so the governments aren't in, in good enough of a fiscal position. They're on a very shaky fiscal position. So if the current, you know, just in the past six weeks, the Mexican currencies depreciated by 24%, the Colombian currencies depreciated by 27%, and the Brazilian currency by 30%, right? Two, Two of those three countries have the high, Colombia and Mexico have the highest credit ratings in, in the emerging market. They also have 80% of their debt in, in uh, denominated in dollars. Neither of those countries, uh, Mexico is about to privatize its oil sector, which is 35% of its annual budget. And all of their maquiladoras, the industrial clusters on the northern border, do, in order to get the companies to come there, they give them a 10 year uh, he, uh, um, break on taxes. And so they actually have the worst among OECD abilities to bring in taxes. They don't have the fiscal position. So that is where, that is where the worst could possibly happen. If you do have private sectors that go under, uh, you're going to have the socialization without the ability to pay. And then the question is, can you borrow the money to socialize? So it's not just like the 80s, it's like Europe, right? The European crisis, except for Greece, was a capital flows crisis in the private sector where Italy, or sorry, not Italy, where uh, Portugal, Ireland, and Spain all had budget surpluses which turned into deficits when they bailed out the private sector. Same thing that happened in Thailand, South Korea, Asian thing was the same exact thing, inflows of capital, into the private sector that got bloated. Governments were also trying to maintain uh, um, fixed exchange rates and had to socialize that stuff and went belly up, just like in the 1980s. And what's really scary and what you have to, sh which, which the emerging markets have not been heroes about, uh, is that they've squandered the commodity boom. The commodity boom from 2003 till 2013 is the longest one in recorded history. And it also had the highest peak in terms of profits. And so you, we should be looking around the statistics of emerging markets right now. We should see huge reserve accumulations. We should be seeing sovereign wealth funds. We should be seeing new development banks or recapitalization of development banks. And uh, instead, we've actually seen the opposite. You know, during a commodity boom, Brazil's investment rate has been 18.6% a year, right? The UNCTAD, World Bank Commission, the World Growth Commission says if you want sustained growth, you need investment at 25% of GDP per year for 10 years. China's has been 45 to 55% for the past 30 years. 
they're off the charts. They probably overinvested, and that's probably going to get them on an, uh, in, in more trouble. But the South Koreas, the Malaysias, uh, Japan in the 1950s and 60s, they were all in the 30s and 40 percent. Latin America's had two terrible decades, 1980s and 1990s, where they only invested about 18, 19 percent. Uh, during this commodity boom, they only raised that one percentage point. And the one country with the greatest development bank and the politics that should be doing this right, Brazil, 18 percent. Venezuela, 14 percent. Argentina, 17 percent. It's incredible that they haven't taken these windfall profits and moved them into productive capabilities, diversifying their, their, uh, their economic base. And so they're all in a shaky position and are not going to be able to respond. So it's not only politically hard, they're not going to have the money. And no one is going to, no international investor is going to lend money to, not even the Chinese are not going to lend money to the Venezuelans to bail out the domestic sector. They're not even going to lend money to the Colombians. Let's take a, another, another round. Hi, David Kim from CJ. Um, I just want to talk about the internal politics of the U.S. to see whether there might be differentiation across institutions. So you seem to suggest that the Treasury is the kind of one key actor that's against, you know, improvements to the regulation of cross-border finance. But is there a differentiation on, on this issue from the Fed, um, from other financial regulators within the U.S. system, which seem to be taking a more kind of systemic risk perspective on all of this? And, and then taking it to the international level, you know, you discuss a lot the IMF and the G20, and I just wanted to know, is there any space for the standard-setting bodies, the BCBS, IOSCO, uh, the CPSS, to get involved in this and perhaps provide a countervailing political power to the kind of the established interests? Great question. Uh, Jeff from Ottawa. If emerging market regulations are good for overall economic growth, why is the U.S. ostensibly opposed to them? Two, uh, two somewhat related questions. Have anyone on this side? Hi. Um, so this is not my field, and maybe it's not an appropriate question. But back in the 1990s and the 2000s, uh, amongst the sort of radical activist left, there were lots of arguments against the IMF because of their structural uh, their, 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 their structural regulations on developing countries. And the argument then was um, that they were, depriving, they were depriving poor countries of being able to work on their infrastructure and their education, and that was going to affect them in the long term. <laughs> so your argument is different, um, but it seems to have the same sort of flavor. And uh, back in the 1990s, all of the people who supported the IMF were saying, no, because if you use protectionism, you're going to leave the countries off poor. So now it's not the 1990s anymore, and we've had two decades. Um, who was right? OK, for, uh, first question. Uh, one thing I learned writing this book, and, and I'm living in Washington, D.C. now and doing a lot of policy work related to this stuff, is the U.S. is not, a mono, not monolithic on this, and, and they actually have, oh, there you are, <laughs> and they, uh, they have um, uh, very different actors with very different positions that are, uh, that are very uncoordinated, which is quite fascinating because I, I've worked on a, uh, I, I've wor I was on uh, the Obama commission to uh, write the rules for our model investment treaties. It's a massive interagency process where everybody knows, uh, you know, they all know this, but fascinatingly on this issue, uh, there isn't. And what people told me in my interviews and what I witnessed firsthand, um, uh, which had turned out to be somewhat of a good thing and somewhat of a bad thing, is that the global finance people in Treasury and the Fed from 2010 to 2012 were all working on Dodd-Frank in Europe. And that the US executive director to the IMF, this wasn't seen as a big, huge thing. That person didn't quite communicate the salience of this. And it, and it flew under the radar screen to a certain level with certain key departments and undersecretaries. And the United States Trade Representative hardly knew anything about it. I've, 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 I've had conversations with folks at, at uh, Treasury and the United States Trade Representative who don't even believe that there's an IMF document that's like this. I was like, yeah, you actually signed it. And so there's lots of internal coordination where some of the folks who might be the most opposed to this didn't know about it. That's one of the reasons why it got through. But some of the folks who are, um, who are, the, who are uh, for it 
were instrumental at the IMF, but they're also out of the game when it comes to trade policy. So the Fed, uh, I've briefed a number of uh, people at the Fed about this, and they say, wow, I can't believe we do that. I can't, go, I can't talk about that, especially the governors. Can't, can't muddle in it, it's just the way the institutions are set up. But we're not monolithic. Um, and people change, right? The chief economist in the International Division of the Treasury during this period had done some of the cutting edge research on this stuff. Uh, the Under Secretary for International Affairs had too. They were much more amenable. Um, but the private interest groups play a key role. The IIF did a number of workshops uh, related to this. Uh, and so there's a, a private, sector, <clears throat> private sector, private sector component. Um, the Jeff says if emerging market regulations are good for overall economic growth, uh, is the U.S. ostensibly opposed to them? Um, very, very good question. Uh, something, we're, something that I, I struggle with with the United States in general. Uh, the United States is, uh, is opposed to the Asian Infrastructure Bank. You know, we heard nothing but that for the past couple of days. Right? It's going to fund long-term economic development in, in countries at a scale that we haven't seen in, since the 1940s. Uh, we're fundamentally against it. Why are we fundamentally against it? It has more to do with geopolitics and special interest groups than it does about good economic sense. Um, Eric Kleiner, I'll quote your other book, uh, we were talking about this at dinner a little bit as well, is that the United States used to have a different ethos that would justify that. Uh, during, during the 1930s and 1940s, uh, the United States Republican Party and the private sector was really, really... Uh, supportive of the Export-Import Bank lending money to Latin American governments for industrialization, for government-led industrialization projects like steel plants. We we're actually funding steel plants in Latin America. Uh, we we're also doing it in, in India. Um, because A, like Jeff says, it, co it creates growth, more growth, even if you don't care about the people in these countries with that you don't know where they are, it means more exports. Um, and the United States had a comparative advantage in capital goods exports at the time, so if you're building up the industrial sectors of these countries, then you have more opportunity for capital exports. And interestingly, the chair of that whole process was a Republican, uh, uh, Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller. And uh, today, one of the big things in Congress is that the Republicans are trying to kill the Export-Import Bank. Uh, they th think it's a terrible program, and just because it's a government program, it's been around since, not, since 80 years. And what's really interesting, there was a coalition between sort of security folks in the 1930s who were concerned about the German threat in Latin America with the US business community that wanted these loans to be a possibility for them to increase capital exports. There was a coalition there. Well, here in Latin America, we've got a similar situation where the Chinese Export Import Bank and the China Development Bank lend more money to Latin American governments than the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Export Import Bank of, China, of the United States combined on an annual basis. Um, and at the same time, the Republican Party has all these bills in Congress to try to kill the Export Import Bank. And so I think it's a mercantilist situation because the powerful interest groups in the United States are the financial sector. And even though the costs to the US financial sector will be significant with these regulations, the benefits in terms of maintaining financial stability uh, outweigh those costs. But especially in the trade agreements when those, the people who bear the, the largest costs are the ones who are able to sue the government, uh, it tips, tips the playing field. So that's, that's my... That's my St. Patrick's Day uh, answer to that one. Now, the IMF in the 1980s, that was a great question. It wasn't, uh, it must be your field. You're hiding behind that warm hat. Um, look, I, I, um, I'm in, uh, uh, the IMF, what's fascinating is that the IMF Research Department in this tiny little 26-page document is a, uh, what myself and the former finance minister of Columbia and what I say in my book is an interesting half step forward. But on many of the issues that you're talked about, they actually haven't learned their lesson. If you, look at, uh, if you look at the Greek program, if you look at the program in Pakistan, they look no different than the Brazilian program and the Argentine programs uh, of the 1980s and the 1990s. And so uh, the IMF, uh, their world economic, I just 
co-edited a special issue of the journal Governance on this, and the people who wrote the papers on fiscal policy uh, have shown that the research department is way ahead. They did these groundbreaking studies that showed that, uh, gosh, uh, if you, uh, that uh, austerity does not bring growth. As a matter of fact, the countries that cut the most had the lowest amount of growth, but that hasn't translated into the programs. Now, some people say, well, that's the ECB, the IMF is the small member, and the tiny little good things that are in these programs, like the Icelandic capital controls, are the IMF, but nine times out of 10, it's the ECB that's the bad guy. Um, the political scientists are sort of trying to tease out and do counterfactuals to find out what part is attributed to, to, to whom, but I think on those fundamental structural adjustment things, uh, the IMF has not changed its tune. Um, but maybe the competition of the new development banks and the contingent reserve arrangement, maybe, uh, will bring competition to this kind of stuff in the world economy. You know, already, uh, China's extended swap lines to Brazil, Argentina, and a number of other countries. And you know, Argentina has been in such a bad situation over the past six or seven years, uh, if it wasn't for China, they would have gone to the IMF probably last year. But China extended an $11 billion currency swap to them, which they've already drawn over a couple billion dollars from just in the past 18 months, where they're taking, taking yuan, selling them for dollars in the US, in, in, the, in, in global markets, and then putting them in uh, the central bank to use as reserves to protect their currency and so forth. And so you already see China uh, on a bilateral basis acting as a lender of last resort uh, in ways that the International Monetary Fund is set up, as it sets up an Asian infrastructure bank, a new development bank, a contingent reserve arrangement, and more of these kinds of things proliferate, uh, it'll create more competition, and maybe, uh, maybe, the, maybe the best idea will win. What I'm really concerned about, however, is that the Chinese have also put in a lot of money without any strings attached to Argentina, Brazil, and a number of different countries. And this is exactly what these political parties have been saying that, they, that the IMF should be doing over the past 30 years, right? Everyone has been criticized in the IMF for giving money. What do you do with the money? You take the money and you send it right back out the door to pay bondholders in the United States and Europe. What the Chinese are doing is they're saying here, Venezuela, $50 billion. Do whatever you want with it, no conditionality. Here, Ecuador, $37 billion, do what you want. Here, uh, Argentina, 40, $32 billion, do whatever, do whatever you want with it. With the exception of Ecuador, most of the countries in Latin America have been using it for consumption. Uh, just quick consumption. Everyone in Venezuela has a flat screen, but you can't find any factories. Uh, Argentina is supposedly building um, railroads, long run infrastructure projects with this money, but I've been in Argentina four or five times since these loans have come. I don't see any railroads. Ecuador is a real, Ecuador is a real, uh, a real example. They've created a number, capitalized new development banks. They have a number of new big hydroelectric power pro uh, projects that have, they've used with this. And, uh, they have the highest investment rate in Latin America. It's still not 25%, but theirs over the past 10 years has been 23%. The Latin American average 20. The Argentinas, Brazils, and so forth have been much lower than 20. So it's not the same, um, but still Ecuador is a dollarized economy that still, even though they've got some cool policies in place, they're still live or die by the dollar and the oil price. And if the oil price gets much, much lower, uh, all these interesting projects in Ecuador will evaporate as well. Catherine. Uh, Kathy Hostiller, and I stood up before you answered the last question, so it might be that you've already answered certain parts of this. But I'm very interested in the question of the, the amount of development space that's available to developing countries at this point. And in thinking, in your talk, one of the things you really stressed in looking at the reopening of development space to re-regulate capital flows was really tied in many ways to this moment when a lot of the problems were being caused by northern countries and their policies and these large systemic flows of money. And I'm wondering, maybe the way I'll phrase it, just to have you answer this question, I'm wondering if maybe this moment of greater openness and, and for more development space for these capital flows is something we're going to look back on even in 10 years and say, well, that was a blip. And it was the global financial crisis. And now we're back to 
countries that didn't invest their money well, or, you know, in Brazil, we've got real classic cases of corruption and money leaking out, and nobody in their right mind would be sending large flows of money to Brazil at this point, but they might well want to keep money from going out. And so I'm, I'm just wondering how much of this whole development space enlargement was really a phenomenon of the global financial crisis that is now going to shut up again. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, Skylar Brooks, my question flows from that uh, pretty nicely. I feel like we're oscillating back and forth between pessimism on one side and some optimism on the other. Uh, I don't think I need to reiterate why we should be pessimistic, but on the optimistic side, um, you know, we have emerging economies like South Korea and Brazil who are now able to use this development space to implement or exercise their countervailing monetary policy or countervailing monetary power, as you call it. Um, so maybe you could elaborate on policy space in the context of the countervailing monetary power theory. Uh, I was just reading this morning in the Financial Times, uh, there was a small article, and the point of the article was that these country groupings, the emerging country groupings, uh, BRICS being the big ones, but we hear about all these acronyms, BASIC, um, IPSA, and they said, well, actually, the only thing that makes them common, that pulls them together, is that they are without international monetary power. And it used this new, quite um, condescending acronym, WIMPs. So really, they're all WIMPs, and they are... Uh, w -H yeah, they are without international monetary power. Um, and that's the only thing that really makes them common as a group. Of course, their conception of international monetary power is that these countries can't borrow on international capital markets in their own currencies, so it makes them very vulnerable to exchange rate risk, makes them vulnerable in the, uh, in the case of a crisis when they can't access foreign, foreign reserves and they can't print their own. Um, so maybe, you know, it seems like we're getting two different messages. We've got increased monetary power from the emerging economies from you. Financial Times sees it differently. Maybe you could elaborate on your theory and talk Great. about that. Yeah. Uh Two, 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 two very related things. I mean, but the, the most fundamental answer to both questions is that the, that the, two, the, 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 two, the world after 2008 is very different than, than the 1990s, all right? At the most fundamental level, and Ben Cohen talks about the hierarchies of money, m most emerging markets are still fundamentally uh, victims of original sin. I guess it's St. Patrick's Day, we'll talk about Catholicism. Um, <laughs> that... Uh, that they were born into the world with currencies that aren't with aren't dollars, um, but and regulations can only countervail, right? They can't prevail; they can countervail. And what's optimistic is that the, is this is just so. I mean, maybe it's because I'm old, right? Uh, this is so much different than the eight, 1990s and the in the 1980s, where the United States International Monetary Fund and the World Bank basically dictated policy all around the world on these issues, and they got it wrong. Right? We had no growth in Latin America for two and a half decades. Right? Massive growth with an alternative set of policies in East Asia until they take the policies and then they all blow themselves up. And so where we are now is, you know, if you take China out of the, out of the, out of the, out of the picture, yeah, a lot of these countries are now in a big fragile moment because they took a big step forward. Right? They took a big step forward. Some of these countries, it's really hard to re-regulate in these conditions of countervailing monetary power, show how hard, it, how hard it, it is. And to get to Catherine's question, all the big growth accelerations that we've had in the world, a lot of them have a lot of luck to do with them. Right? South Korea's takeoff, the United States is there covering the military situation for the country. All right, funding industrialization or giving policy space for it for, for uh, security reasons. As Eric talks about in his, his, his research, the US government is much more behind industrial policies and industrial diversification in Latin America for foreign, for foreign policy and security reasons. Right? It seems like the, the, uh, the security trumping mercantilist U.S. interest is less what you see in the emerging market powers where there's no terrorism, right? That'd be a good research question for a political scientist to really examine if that's statistically true, but if you look around, uh, 
the, the it's, it's, it's hard, right? We, we will fund, we put a lot of economic development assistance into Afghanistan and Iraq. I have a lot of students who've worked on these projects where they're building factories. You know, so I just built a factory in Iraq uh, and uh, I lost my finger at that, not from, not from being in the, uh, at war. And, and here I am, I wanna learn how to do this economic development stuff. Uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're not doing that. Uh, we're not doing that uh, uh, as much. And so there are, there are these moments, and the financial crisis was the moment. Was there a Rahm Emanuel, right? You can't let a good crisis go to, go to waste. And uh, some countries seized it. They got a little piece, and, and yeah, we'll have to see. Um, you know, there's this political scientist, Jeffrey Schweiroth. Is that how I say his last name? Um, the, one of the good things about this particular issue, not, in, not a lot of other big development issues, is that there really has been a fundamental change in the mainstream frontier economists on this, right? Until 2004, 2005, economists with PhDs in economics who wanted to regulate capital flows were either practitioners in central banks who had to use it to pull it out of a toolbox to try to save themselves, or they were uh, a group that are referred to as post-Keynesians who, who, um, uh, who who mostly did, weren't trained in the West, who, um, who are very inspired by the original writings of Keynes and people like Hyman Minsky and Raoul Prebisch and others, which are very far out of the mainstream. They found their ways in to left political um, central banks around the world, but they're far from the mainstream. What's fundamentally different now is that there's a sea change within the core of the profession. It's a hot thing to model. Uh, you know, to create a mathematical model of a financial economy assuming information externalities and overlaying it with game theory about what happens when uh, investor X is the one that tips the house of cards over and modeling the extent to which a, 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 what is, the, they literally have fights over what the optimal tax and what the optimal tax on financial flows in Indonesia should be. Should it be 2%, should it be 4%, should it be in uh, derivatives. And so if Jeff is right, um, and you have more of these open-minded Blanchards as the head of research at, um, uh, at the IMF, and Hushang Shun at, at the head of research at the BIS, who's actually the hero and mastermind behind the South Korean regulations. These people foster this kind of new thinking. They're gonna get these new economists in there. And what some political scientists have shown is that that stuff has longer staying power if that becomes institutionalized. Those kind of people, that kind of thinking, the constant bringing in of new ideas. Now, if some new idea comes in 10 years or if a whole bunch of econometrics show that the Brazilians squandered their regulations and only South Korea has worked, and then we could be right back. Um, and uh, you, we'll need another crisis or another war to uh, think fresh again. I think I answered, I, I hope I answered everybody's questions. No additional onlines. Oh. I just have oh. one question. Um, I was wondering if there is any conclusion you may draw between the efficacy of uh, regulations and the prevailing exchange rate system. So um, my understanding is that a, co a country can have a fixed exchange rate system or a flexible one, and that would um, impact the outcome of uh, the countries or the economies prevailing monetary policy in terms of uh, whether the effect is Im immediate or you know whether it takes more time so to rephrase my question yeah, I, I got it yeah. I, it's a question I get uh, all, all the time and that we we talk about um, to temper the development state space question again, I mean, what, what makes me an optimist is that it's not the 1980s anymore and it's not our grandfather's IMF, as my, Eileen, my friend Eileen Grable talks about, is that thing, things are changing, they are moving in the right direction. We don't know if these alternatives are gonna end up that good, um, but we're in a period of, exper ex uh, of experimentation of all these new institutions and will the new development bank have a different research group that has a different set of ideas and will there be a competition of ideas and policies where we can get stuff right? Uh, maybe. I'm really concerned and critical of my own country uh, for, for the past decade telling the Chinese, telling emerging markets that they need to be res responsible stakeholders, that they need to start erecting uh, and paying for climate change and infrastructure investment and so forth and the Chinese have built this bank 
in the United States uh, has been asked to come in and help negotiate what the terms will be, and we're refusing to be at the table where we could put all these things that we're supposedly concerned about on the table. And now, over the past three or four days, we've actually gone after the UK, the French, the Germans, uh, and next week, the Australians and the South Koreans when they, when they join. Fixed versus flexible exchange rates. Both of them has risks. A flexible exchange rate uh, used to be seen as a big solution. Right? So in the IMF new guidelines, they say the things that you want to do before capital account regulations, or at least this was the proposal of the US, uh, but after the G20 process, now countries are, if you look at the document closely, you, you could use all these things at the same time with A, accumulate reserves, right? Foreign exchange is coming in, it's making your currency go up. Well, get some of your currency out there on the street to damp dampen the value of it. Another thing is don't have a fixed exchange rate because you're going to have to spend so much time, to, uh, so many, you know, you have to spend so much time defending it. If you have a flexible exchange rate, it can buffer it. The flexible exchange rates will be a lot better if we live in a world with more development banks that provide credit to uh, domestic industries and a, and, a, and a world where there's a lot more of domestic bond markets um, because of original sin, right? Because of the dollar denominated debt problem. So exchange rates can actually be just as big of a, a flexible exchange rate can be just as big of a problem. You've got Colombia with an incredible, uh, and Mexico with incredible uh, credit ratings. Right? But all of a sudden, they're the talk of the Financial Times, they're the talk of the Moody's desk because currency is going down 20%. If currency is going down 20% and the corporate sector has 75% of its debt in, in dollars um, and Colombia isn't selling the oil and the coal to the Chinese anymore, uh, where are they going to get those pesos to pay back those international debts? So it's not a panacea. Um, you need a family of things to be working at. You need flexible exchange rate. You need to be able to use some reserves. You need to have bank regulations on, uh, on, on, on you know, basic, basic capital requirements. So that's not going to help you so much from inflows because capital is coming from somebody else, somewhere else, not your bank. You need capital account regulations. And you, you, need the, you need the whole suite of them. And sometimes the capital account regulation might be the only thing you have. Like I said, moving forward, Commodity prices down, you're much more reluctant to use it reserves because you're not accumulating anything like you did over the past 10 years. Some countries, they don't, they don't work. It's harder to sterilize. So it's not, it's, it's not a panacea, but it can help. Um, it's, it's, it's never going to be the solution. Uh, even with domestic bond markets, uh, the BIS estimates that domestic emerging market bonds Don't quote me on the precise number. It's somewhat 68 to 72 percent of it is held by foreigners. Okay, so you don't get the exchange rate risk, but you can still get the foreigners dumping all the domestic bonds to go into the U.S. Right, so that has systemic problems too. It's not as bad, but it's not a not a solution. Thanks. Thank you for having me, folks. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Go drink a beer. A few quick comments before we adjourn. Uh, a couple of thank yous. First, I want to thank uh, Kathy Hochschletter and er Eric Kleiner of the University of Waterloo and the Balsley School of International Affairs uh, for bringing our speaker here uh, tonight from Boston. And then especially thanks to you, Kevin, for your uh, lecture this evening. I think we can all agree that the re-regulation of cross-border capital flows is not the stuff of dinner table chatter in the average household. But as a non-expert, I certainly found your presentation a very clear and accessible explanation of why it matters to the global economy that we all depend on, um, how a few brave and clever emerging economies manage to do it. And uh, it helps, of course, that you um, have pictures of flying money and uh, and uh, name drop Canadians like Sylvia Austri and mention the Seagram's whiskey example in Waterloo. Uh, but certainly you're a very effective presenter and I think we all understand better now uh, how good financial regulation can affect uh, the health of the global economy and what still remains to be done. So, in summary, I think you've certainly earned that pint of Guinness tonight. Thank you very much.
Uh, the edited video of this evening's live webcast will be posted to the CG website. You can post uh, your own comments on the blog that we'll have there. And in the coming weeks, we invite you to join us at a couple of other public events here in the CG Auditorium. Uh, next week on Thursday, March 26, we're excited to have sustainability expert Johan Rocks from here from Sweden to discuss the relationship between the economy and the environment. And the following week, on Tuesday, March 31st, Professor Jack Goldstone from George Mason University will discuss the impact of growing population on the stability and security of our world as we approach 10 billion people. So register online for the event's newsletter and be sure to attend our upcoming events. Thank you again. Have a safe journey home.